Welcome to another exciting episode of Marketing Speak. I'm your host, Stefan Spencer. I'm super excited to have today with us Bastian Grimm. Bastian is CEO and co-founder of Peak Ace. He's a renowned expert in large-scale international SEO. He's always eager to expand his knowledge with more than 19 years experience in online marketing, technical and global SEO. Bastian currently oversees Peak Ace's search engine optimization as well as content marketing initiatives. Bastian, it's so great to have you on the show. Thank you very much for having me. So let's talk first of all about uh, tech SEO and how it's changed over the years. Like, w there's a lot of uh, nuance to technical SEO in terms of uh, a lot of folks don't understand the difference between, for example, crawl budget and index budget. They don't understand the implications of using disallows when they should be using no indexes and stuff like that. Um, but that's been around for a while. But there. Yeah, you know, technical SEO has become more complex as time has gone on. So, what are your thoughts about um, the evolution of technical SEO? Yeah, I think you're you're totally right. I mean, those the ones that you mentioned, they've been really around kind of for ages, right? But I think especially recently, let's say like the last, I'd say two years, maybe three years, there's a whole bunch of new things kind of uh, that that Google, but also like probably in general, the engines kind of put out, right? So, I mean. Let's think about AMP for a second, right? One of their like first big pushes to really establish somewhat a new technology slash framework kind of situation, or you know just recently the entire thing with Google starting to execute JavaScript, starting to render sites, and which I think then brings in a whole bunch of new things that you all of a sudden need to understand because you are dealing with a second crawler in a sense or a crawler with different capabilities. And and people kind of get confused, you know, how is that actually working? Why is Google doing this? What what do I need to consider um, in terms of my kind of tech SEO work? And yeah, I think it it really there's just way more topics now that are somewhat in a mix. And if you think about it from like an SEO auditing and recommendation perspective, I would say, you know, those that have been doing it for a while, they would probably have to. Um, upgrade their default set of recommendations because there's just so many new things that you need to look at when you do like assessments um, and audits and give recommendations to clients, right? Right. So what would be some of the things that are kind of staple, important things to have in a technical audit these days that you wouldn't have had in an audit, let's say, five years ago? I would say clearly the the entire situation around uh, how Google is dealing with JavaScript. Can they actually understand what you what you're throwing out there? I mean, um, I think we actually started doing like I almost said like one audit for like the, the old school Google bot, if that makes sense. So like the regular, you know, crawlability uh, situation. How do they get through it? And then on top of it, do like a second layer type of analysis, trying to understand, you know, what does JavaScript throw into the mix? Um, how does that maybe impact or even interfere with what I was trying to do, right? So think about, you know, you have default meta tags in place and all of a sudden something on the JavaScript layer might kind of interfere with that and change, you know, indexing directives and whatnot. So I think, yeah, this 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 entire dimension of Google rendering, executing, I think is is something that that uh, really takes quite a bit of time now to 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 do on top of the regular work. So let's let's dive into that a little bit. So what mm -hmm. are some of the tools and the processes that you employ to uh, evaluate the JavaScript's crawlability and indexability of a website? Like for example, do you still look at uh, the Google cache or do you don't bother with that? Do you still look at uh, Google fetch and render in, inside the search console or are you just searching for content that you know is part of the, the JavaScript of the page? just doing a Google search within quotes for a phrase to see if that shows up in the search results on a site colon search, all of the above, none of the above. What are you up to? Yeah, I think it's, I mean, you kind of outlined quite a bit of them. Like, let's start with the beginning, right? So I think Google Cache is almost, I wouldn't say entirely useless, but I think from a JavaScript slash rendering perspective, it doesn't help you much. So I think we can kind of put that on the side. Um, the Search Console, I mean, obviously only really works well once you have access. So if you do like, you know, competitive analysis and whatnot, you mean, surely you do that for, you know, that client's uh, site guaranteed, but otherwise it doesn't help you much either. Um, but then if we stay for Search Console with a bit, I think 
the definitely what helps to inspect uh, URL tool. I mean, that kind of became quite powerful, and they do have uh, kind of a snapshot slash preview, and they do have the the rendered markup in there. So I think um, running the the URL inspection and then trying to understand how does the the rendered HTML or the rendered DOM um, look like, and is you know what you think should be included also in there is definitely a good help, right? So that gives you a bit of an idea. Um, I mean, it doesn't really scale much, but if you do that on a per template basis, we can talk about scalability in a second, but if you do that on a per template basis, you know, most important category, your homepage and whatnot, I think that gives a good understanding um, if things go really, really wrong, right? The the second um, tool that I think is really helpful is um, Google's uh, rich results testing tool, um, which is, I mean, free for everyone to use and you can literally plug in every URL that's out there, um, also from competition, and they have a section or like um, um, a link in there that says view rendered DOM. So in that way, you can also do it without really having to bother um, kind of with the search console access. So I think that really helps. And if you want to take it one step further, um, what I would do and what we do oftentimes is then we we use this, this, this rendered DOM and compare it um, with what you would see in the regular markup. So there's tools like um, divchecker.com, divchecker.com, for example. Um, so you can just compare rendered versus unrendered. Or there's even a, a plugin for Chrome. I think I believe the name is View Rendered um, Source, and it does just does like a comparison in the browser. So it's really helpful if you don't want to poke around and want to understand if there's any kind of you know JavaScript going uh, entirely wrong. So I think that's that's like the if you do more punctual um, analysis and auditing. If you want to scale it a bit further, I suppose what you need to do is you need to run any of your crawlers uh, uh, of choice, what you have out there. So like a Screaming Frog, a Deep Crawl and whatnot, they all have like nowadays at least rendering options. So you can go on a larger scale. But oftentimes when we when we start poking around, it's more like this kind of on point. You, you look into templates, you look in certain specific things because it oftentimes gives you already like an implication if, if something is really uh, working or not working well. Yeah. So what are your favorite crawling tools? Do you use Write, for example, uh, On Crawl, Deep Crawl, Screaming Frog? Which ones are your go-to tools and which ones do you not recommend anymore? Um, I, I think it, it really, really goes down to um, to personal choice as well. And I think also a bit about, it's also really about scale. I mean, obviously I'm a bit biased. So I'm, I'm sitting in the in the Deep Crawl customer advisory board. So I, um, I of course, use Deep Crawl quite a lot. I do uh, love Screaming Frog as well because for quick stuff on a machine, um, you know, just run it locally. Um, it's it's really helpful and really powerful, especially with their new stuff. Um, they, they've done a good job. So, uh, you know, I wouldn't say, whom not to use really to be very honest i think it, it comes down to personal taste and they are somewhat all like comparable right some can deal better with log files others don't so it, it at the end of the day it depends on what you what you really want and what you really like um i think more importantly it's about the the workflows and the team's needs uh, in the sense of what they what they want and what they need so one of the things for example why i what we're still using deep when we started using that early on was that they one of the first were like to have um, report sharing capabilities. So if you work in large t in large teams, you know it's it's really a pain if you have to download and upload and do screenshots of reports. And you're like, this is not really efficient, right? So um, you could just simply share a link. You got it's exactly to the report uh, that I was looking at. Um, you could show it with clients. So that was really helpful. So I think it's those things. Really try to understand what what you need in the team and how your team works. And I think then based on that, I would pick um, uh, probably something that fits my my uh, my workflows. Yeah. And uh, you mentioned log file analysis. Mm -hmm. so Screaming Frog, for example, has a separate tool. They've got the SEO Correct. Uh, spider and they've got the, the log file analyzer. And yeah. then you'll have like on crawl, for example, has it built into the, to the suite. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to utilize a, a special different login, but that's also uh, a cloud-based software as a service. So that's a little different, whereas Screaming Frog is uh, a desktop application. So are you constantly using the log file an analysis capabilities of, uh, let's say, deep crawl, or is this kind of more for a specialized case? Let's say there's something you're trying to diagnose that doesn't seem right. I mean, a lot of SEOs don't do any log file analysis. They don't even ask yeah. for the uh, log file you know from you know google bot accesses for the last x amount of period of time and then they you know submit the audit and it's okay here yeah uh, um I, I think that's wrong to be honest i mean um the, the, the big problem though is and i i maybe that's a 
that's an excuse to have if you so will. I mean, it's oftentimes, depending on the complexity of an organization and like the kind of restrictions and political kind of games that have been played, uh, oftentimes it's hard to get access to log files. I do get that. Um, but I think what we're trying to do for all of our clients really is to get log file access as early as possible, either in a form of that, that, that we can like, you know, have, as you said, uh, cloud-based access through just a standalone log file tool or ideally um, something um, deeply uh, integrated. So because my, my problem really is, and you, you said one very, very good point here, is the fact that um, if you just look at log files as they are, I mean, A, they can be quite overwhelming. B, what I'm missing um, uh, in my mind is the fact that, I mean, yes, I do see the requests that crawlers do or don't do, but I don't really have the capability to overlay that um, with, you know, SEO directives or even even more interestingly for me, you know, traffic, for example. So analytics and, and GSC data. So I what I do like is the approach of the likes of, you know, Bodify, deep crawl, um, um, on crawl to kind of overlay crawl data um, with with log file data. The problem, though, is what, what they are doing is they're using the web crawl as the starting point, and then they're matching it with the request that, that you can have or that you find in log files. Problem is then you're missing out the other dimension. So for us, what we ended up doing is we build a stack um, based on, um, on, on BigQuery. So what we're doing is basically we're running log files, uh, crawl data, analytics data, and GSC data, and we pipe them into uh, into a BigQuery. Um, there's a tool or a service called Data Prep, uh, Cloud Data Prep from Google. And then you can, it's kind of an Excel um, on, on steroids in the cloud, if that makes sense. So that you overlay everything based on URLs, you pipe that into, um, into BigQuery, and then we use like a data studio on top of it to just have like a full view. So I can go in, I drill down on a URL, I see how is it being crawled, how frequently is it being crawled, what, you know, is it, you know, what's the status codes, what's my indexing directives, what's the traffic and whatnot. So I think that way, um, and that's that's one of the things that really annoys me is that people look at single data sources. I mean, there's, right, there's so much data out there, but, you know, I think the, it, it really starts becoming useful when you when you kind of start to overlay and join it um, for, for like way better insights because, you know, the tools themselves, they're somewhat just simulating Google crawl behavior. Granted, there's not much they can do about that, but like that's why I'm really a big fan of using log files and putting them um, into, into good use. And I think overlaying them is the most powerful approach in my mind. Right. So you're using uh, Google Data Studio and creating dashboards to mm -hmm. share with your client. What uh, what does a dashboard look like, and how does that differ from the typical kind of SEO person or agency's dashboard? Yeah, I mean the 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 main reason the main reason for us. Dashboards and Data Studio. I think the the main difference here is that um, so I mean as an agency, obviously we people are asking, can you integrate with Data Studio because it's so popular by now, right? I mean, literally everyone, and I have to give it to Google, right? It's one of those things that works really well. It is for free. It's it's relatively easy to customize. If you have been playing with those, um, I feel it's oftentimes easier than something like a Tableau or anything like that. So it's I mean. They have done it quite well, let's put it that way. So I think um, that was one of the main reasons why like, we decided at some point, and we're, we're Google fanboys in, in a sense, right? Like, I mean, we do paid search as well. So of course, we kind of somewhat used to using Google products and the Google stack. So BigQuery data studio felt quite natural. I think that was one of the reasons actually. So we thought like it would be easier for, um, for our clients to kind of just look at one kind of tool that looks almost all times the same. So that was the main reason for us to do it. And I mean, um, coming back to your questions in terms of how does it look differently, I think, as I said, the main point for us is really that you have one view. I mean, of course, you can I mean, you drill down by crawler, but at the end of the day, you have like this, like all the columns lined up with all the different kind of data sources merged into one. So you have the URL, you have like your, your crawl depth, you have, you know, is it index or no index? Is it blocked by robots? But you got the, the traffic from um, from log files as well. You have um, GSC overlay, right? So what's the impression share, et cetera, because you can get a, can get all of that uh, through the, uh, the API is relatively easy with almost all of the tools nowadays. So we just decided we run um, an app script uh, that calls the APIs um, directly through BigQuery. So we just go to the tool providers, we get the data and put them straight onto, onto BigQuery. So it's really it's really simple. And I think this is also the great thing. It's very simple to to customize and and um, and and integrate into existing reports as well. So yeah. 
Yep. And uh, so let me ask you this. If, if uh, you had to pick a handful of metrics to report to the client, and let's say the client is uh, not that technically savvy, so you're dealing with, let's say, an executive or the CEO even, they're not that technical. They just want to no. know what the bottom line is. Like, what are you doing for me in terms of my investment in SEO? What are the handful, maybe no more than a dozen metrics that you would provide either on a, a dashboard or in a spreadsheet that would convey the importance of what you're doing and the value that you're creating? Yeah, I think you, you're you getting to, to an interesting point because at the end of the day, that goes down to the fact that you need to deliver different types of dashboards, uh, even for one client. And usually that's one for like the C-suite, you're totally correct. And, and the second one is probably for like an, a marketing executive. And then you eventually have even like a third level that's somewhat down to like the kind of the tech SEO specialist. And those are very, like very different in terms of the level of level of detail. I totally agree. Um, kind of going back to your like um, CEO example, I suppose the, the one thing that that I think from an SEO perspective can show value or all, not only value, but also kind of reflect on the work that you've been doing is, I mean, essentially organic traffic and then it's it's organic traffic, you know, increase <laughs> ideally and not decrease. But um, so organic traffic, uh, I think, is the, is, is the metric. Um, but also then I think what is a great metric um, or a comparison metric is the organic travel, uh, traffic channel split. So how does that compare towards like PPC and are you eventually even in a position to increase like, total traffic share. So say like one year you have only 20% SEO traffic and then the next year it kind of goes up to like 30 um, if you look at uh, channel mix, for example. So I think we're trying to keep that really very high level. And at the end of the day, I mean, if it's if it's e-com and if it's not, if it's not like, you know, um, say a model that's uh, pay to you driven or something like that, then of course, I mean, you can and should probably tie in, um, you know, cost per sale, um, you know, or per lead or whatever that kind of happens after um, you you bring traffic, but in my mind, I mean fundamentally SEO is a traffic acquisition channel. So um, I think organic traffic is the one metric I would be looking at um, quite regularly. And then I think what we do usually is we try to bring in like soft metrics or additional metrics, if that makes sense. So come on, on like in a second second level, second level, second layer type of situation where like they I think depend on the business model so you know something like um, uh, time on site and, and, and bounce rate and whatnot or even a combination of those I think are good to look at if you um, you know if you want to just see how people are actually behaving or interacting with your site and then I think we all agree I mean there's this entire debate on you know what's a what's a ranking factor and whatnot I don't want to get into this but I think um, if you want to, <laughs> um, if you want to get into more like a north star metric situation, then I think a combination of the, those types of things: time on site, um, scroll depth, uh, you know, something like um, like bounce rate in combination. That is something that I would be looking at, um, really, depending on the on the site and on the business model of the site. Right, but then Google swears up and down they're not using time on site and bounce rate. Yeah, yeah. Because then they would have to spy on your Google Analytics, and then everybody would leave Google Analytics because it's being used against them instead of being an independent uh, siloed tool. Yep. So, that's why I said it's it, it, as a North Star metric. I would. That's why I tried to phrase it the way. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I think it gives you an indication if people tend to like what you're doing or what you're offering on the site. And I think that can't be a bad way to approach things, I suppose. But then again, like I mean, we all know if you're on a price comparison, something like a short time on site probably can be good uh, because you go on, you land on the on the offer, you find it, you click out, right? So it really depends, I suppose, on the. And that's why I think it's so hard for people to gas the concept. Like it, this doesn't fit for everyone. Um, so you have to see it in the context of the site and the offering. Yeah. Do you think that dwell time is being used by Google? <laughs> I know you would be asking that. <laughs> well, I, um, let's say I would be surprised if they wouldn't be looking at that in one way or the other. Uh, it would be quite. It would be quite strange for me having that information not looking at that at all. So I doubt that yeah, they're not I mean, doing. They, there is a cost in tracking the clicks from the organic search results and not just the paid ads. So they're doing it for a reason. And when they say yep. that, oh, we're not using dwell time, I, yeah, I think that's disinformation. Uh, I, yeah.
I'm glad I'm not the only one thinking that. That's uh, that's good. Yeah. <laughs> So click-through rate, uh, where does that fit into the rankings algorithm, do you think? From the well, it's a bit of, this, of course. Yeah, that, I mean, it's a bit of the same story, right? I mean, um, I would, like, I think if you were not making use of the fact that Google gives you something like um, impression share um, or impressions in general in, in Search Console, and if you would not go and try to make the best snippet possible i think you would just be wasting time and money um so you know that said i think um it can't hurt to get more traffic uh, on the site right and that would mean that you know one way or the other um clicking on a result and then you know fulfilling this north star situation um on your offering is the right way to do um so or to be more precise i very much think that you know, creating and crafting proper snippets, um, be the titles, be the descriptions. You know, um, there's so many people doing basic mistakes, such as such as not having a call to action, such as not advertising with their USPs. Um, if you do that right, and everyone else does it wrong, it definitely helps. Yeah, and so now Google has this uh, new Max Snippets uh, capability where you can really granularly change the length of the uh, of the meta description, the snippet. So yeah. where do you see that fitting in? Is that a very valuable tool uh, for the SEO practitioner's arsenal? Or is that kind of a uh, edge case that you would potentially use that? I think, to be very honest with you, I'm not really sure that even Google likes this thing. Um, because you know, if you look at the entire debate that we're having in Europe around uh, regulation and uh, and the entire situation around Google, you know, the, the, being the monopolist and, and whatnot, I think. Um, and then also this, you know, kind of adding on top of that, the debate that we had in France, where I think this somewhat um, originated um, the publishing companies complaining about the fact that you know they had they don't have enough control and that is Google is essentially st stealing somewhat their content by showing a preview and that they couldn't opt out. I think this is more the root to this entire thing. Um, I personally really don't think that this is going to be a massive that it's going to be a massive adoption from outside of the publishing industry. I would be surprised because again. Why would you like you want the best possible snippet? And if you do your work right, there's not really much sense in limiting that. Um, I mean, there's, it goes even further, right? It's not only it's not only snippet. It's also marking up sections in the in the in the HTML, I believe, or in the in the body where you can like specifically exclude uh, certain you know classes or diff you know diff elements or span elements and whatnot from being pulled into the meta description but at the end of the day i mean isn't that just you know you're not doing your proper homework because if you would have had a meta description in the first place that's somewhat decent and somewhat like fulfilling um the, the kind of the expectation of uh, towards a meta description that you would not need to go and say like, well please do not include this paragraph but maybe do that par this paragraph i don't know i i am maybe i'm just missing something here but it doesn't feel to me that this is going to be a very widely adopted kind of um, tool in the arsenal. Yeah, yeah, I don't, I don't see it as a game changer. Nor do I yeah. see the whole UGC markup of, of <laughs> links instead of using just the regular nofollow. I don't see that as a needle mover for anybody. Or I don't see any benefit for anybody but Google to go to that trouble. You, I would, I think? would, yeah, I would totally agree. Um, I would totally agree because I mean, I think the only thing that it tells us is that basically Google, I suppose, A, still looks at links, um, and B, was deadly afraid of the fact that uh, with sites, big sites, um, kind of issuing this global somewhat no-follow policy towards like, you know, everything that they publish, that they're kind of getting blind to the to some of the links that are really relevant, right? And I mean, if you would have asked me like a year ago and said, well, you know, Wikipedia is a no-follow, just you know, one of the examples, I think PBC, CNBC were the same. Like, would you not take the link because it's no-follow? It's like, well, of course we'll take the link, right? So I, you know, I agree. It's, it's in their interest and it's in their benefit. And I don't really see why I would waste my time. But the, the funny thing is, so I, I was doing a workshop the other day and, you know, it's it's really like people then mixing something like, you know, external no follow and internal no follow. And I think as long as we're discussing around or de debating around those basic things, 
there will people doing there will be people doing this just for the sake of because Google said they have to do it, and then that gives Google more training data. So I mean, well played them. Yeah, and and uh, I, I just find it ridiculous that anyone would internally no follow anything of theirs. I you know it it makes me cringe. Like I I I don't understand it. I think I mean. Well, I do understand probably where they came from back in the, you know, if you look at like oh, 10 years ago days, or something. Yeah, page exactly, page. right? Ex exactly. That's that's the thing. But I think the problem is also like this attribute has such a um, like a generic name. There's some people that think, you know, no following it would mean that Google would not be crawling it. If you look at uh, log files at any given point in time, you would see that they don't care about that. I mean, there are some people saying, well, this significantly helped me to change crawlability of my site. I mean, good for them, to be very honest. I have, like, we have been dealing with, and me personally as well, with some of the probably larger sites around. And, like, I think if, you know, uh, if there's a URL that you don't want, be, don't want to be crawled, then no follow does not do a whole bunch, then you need to apply something more drastic, um, if you ask me. But, hey, I mean, again, if it works for them, fine. But internally, no following them. Nope. Yeah, it's a bad idea. And if you want pages to not get indexed, then you need to no use no index and not use a disallow and not use no follows. None of that yeah. is, is you're obscuring the issue for one by using these other techniques. And for another, you're actually blocking Googlebot if you use a disallow from seeing the no index and obeying it. Yeah, and you're, you're basically just that as well. And then you're basically just so internal no follow, internal no index, and then in worst case, as you said, like when you have robots text in the mix, I think not only not only have you just destroyed the fact that Google can even read your no index or not. I mean, this is not going to happen if you disallow it. Entirely agree. Um, secondly, I think you're also basically ruining your your link internal link graph, right? Because you know, let's say there's some external inbound links coming in. They point to you know a folder, a file, and whatnot that's being um, that's being disallowed. You would also lose the, the the link equity. Why would you do that? So I'm like I'm a huge fan, and I, it seems you are as well. I'm a huge fan of you know just having a very minimalistic robots text. Essentially, let them crawl um, as much as they want and as they can. Right. If there's not anything going crazy wrong. That's I think is a good way, and then be very granular and go no index where you think it's needed. I think that's the best way to do it. Yeah, yeah. And then folks will say, "Well, that wastes crawl budget," and uh, that's ridiculous. First of all, for most people who are saying that they have a small site, crawl budget's really only applicable uh, if you have a really slow loading website or you've got millions of pages, not hundreds of thousands of pages. Google's fine with that. But what really is an, an issue is index budget. And then when I use that term, people are like, what? What's that? Never heard of that term. So what's your take on crawl budget versus index budget? 100% agree. I would, I, would, I would always you know, look at index budget first and foremost because that's somewhat limited. That would be capped depending on you know, strength of domain, how old it is, how trusted it is, how does the link profile look like, how much new stuff is being published, et cetera, et cetera. So totally agree. I think um, index budget first and foremost. Um, and then I think everything else comes after. I do also very much agree and I'm um, a strong advocate of fast loading sites, not because uh, not only because I'm you know somewhat impatient and I just hate sites being very slow, uh, I do agree on what you said. Like it, that is one of the things that really kind of makes a difference in terms of uh, crawling in general. And I think even more so nowadays when we look at rendering, because you know, with all the added on JavaScript images, CSS, and whatnot that um, Googlebot needs to download for rendering, it's somewhat even worse, right? Because it's not only like the, the kind of plain stupid um, HTML response that we had to deal with before where people already had troubles. Now it's even worse. It's like a full website, go figure, that needs to be fast. And uh, I think that's those are the two big things. I mean, crawling after that or crawl budget after that, I think, as you said, I think if you're looking at a million URLs and more, um, then that's something that you can worry about. Before that, everything else is probably way more important. And it's also quite funny because People then think like, well, I have a problem with my with crawl budget and whatnot. But what they really have is then, you know, thin pages, near duplicate pages, and all the crap that that Google is just wasting time on. If they would have kind of no index set in the first place, I mean, 
then you, they wouldn't even have to worry about that. So yeah, it, it's kind of going a bit in circles, but I, I would very much agree on the fact indexing first and everything else after. Right. But let's say that there are millions of pages. So I have clients with millions of pages. Mm. Uh, a number of, of them have millions and millions of pages. Uh, and so then crawl budget is something to be concerned about, but then you also have to uh, consider that index budget being more important has to be weighed in first. So what I recommend is, let's take a site that has, for example, millions of pages and a large number of those pages are no index. Now I won't go into the, uh, the reason why, but let's just say it's, it's essentially it's duplicate content from elsewhere on the web. And uh, you know, it's totally legal and uh, available for them to use this content, but they no index it and that's fine, uh, but that means that a majority of those millions of pages are no indexed. And I think that mm -hmm. sends a not a great signal to Google that the overall site, there's something not quite right. That's an unusual situation. I think at a minimum that opens up them up to additional scrutiny by some advanced algorithms because that's not normal. What, what's your take on that? Well, I mean, I think so. The good thing with that is that they, like the no index pages, they would not be looking at with like the core quality algorithms, at least by my understanding. So I think if you, you know, if you were going to go back for a couple of months or even years and you were trying to fix like Panda related issues, I think no indexing worked just fine, right? So I think that's why we all started using it, let's say, probably more aggressively. And I, you know, we have also sites where we ended up like no indexing. 90 95 percent of all urls because they were like either thin or they were just bad quality or you know they didn't um get any organic traction so you know if you just stuff them in the index so well, that's probably not a way to do it there are facets of, uh, of a faceted navigation uh, tool so it's just slicing and dicing the same product catalog umpteen mm, some somewhere some yeah, somewhere, um, which you're right, that's then one of the points. If you look at e-com, like um, faceted navigation is probably the biggest problem um, that, that they have. Um, but another one was actually um, like a very large um, UGC forum uh, situation. And what uh, they have, I mean, most very popular forums have something like an off-topic other whatever section. And it was just a whole bunch of like not great stuff in there let's put it that way mm -hmm. um so we ended up going like full no index on this other board and and some other off-topic forums as well to just keep the like the really kind of juicy ugc indexed and um that worked quite well i have to say so i think i mean i do understand where you're coming from and like if you look at it from like a resource usage perspective then i mean if you turn it around what i just said like would mean that for that site they would have wasted 90-ish percent of their time crawling sites just to see, well, this is no index. Um, yeah, well, you know, this is just not really be, you be careful about my resources. Um, so, but it's a bit of a hand egg problem, right? I think, you know, what to do first and what to do last. Um, this is why I kind of liked the the combination of a disallow and no index and robots text, which thank you, Google, um, is now not working anymore, which is a bit of a shame because that, that solved a bit of the, the issue um going back to what would you do um i think for like for example for facetted navigation i would rather look at something like um, a post redirect get pattern so you know javascript in the in, in the forefront so that it's not even like a really like a real link in the markup but rather something that's you know that requires like an additional javascript and then transforms like I don't know, uh, a, a diff or a spawn into something clickable so that the crawler doesn't even run into it. I mean, of course, that does not really help you if they already kind of knew about the like the other 10 million no index URLs. Um, but yeah, I suppose that's the way I would probably look at that. And is that even uh, a, a long term solution if Google's getting better and better at executing JavaScript? Won't it eventually be able to? execute the javascript in a way that uh the user is going to get the same experience that the user will and it will become a well i mean one. um the, the i mean i think for that you would have to see how they are going to continue with chrome and the capabilities for now one of the things that they're not doing is they're not executing any kind of user interaction so if you would 
use a JavaScript that only um, will be fired when, when an event like, I don't know, on scroll or something like that, uh, you know, there's going to be dozens more that they're not using, um, is being executed, then right now that works quite well, right? But I mean, is anyone guess how long that is, is this going to happen uh, or is it going to last, right? So, but I mean, then again, we're an SEO, right? So this, this we have been playing this game for about 20 years almost. So I suppose, you know, there's always going to be something that works now and eventually not in, in, in five years time. But then the question is, can I, uh, can I afford to not use it in, as long as it gains me um, an advantage over the rest, right? So... Yeah, it's like the the no index directive in robust.txt that was never officially supported by Google. Yeah. So we knew as SEOs who were using that as a stopgap measure because it was potentially so difficult to implement no index in a meta robots tag. This was just a workaround, a temporary workaround yeah. that ended up going for years and years that you know, now we're our hand is forced by Google's yeah. uh, deprecation of that unofficially supported and now unsupported function yeah yeah so um let's go back to this idea of like the 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 dashboard or the uh the executive overview of what's happening with seo what kind mm -hmm. of predictive metrics do you work into the mix because of course organic traffic is not uh, a leading metric, it's a lagging metric. You do stuff, you wait for the impact, especially with things like link building, you need to be monitoring other things as well and say, all right, well, LVT is improving, uh, like link velocity trends, uh, the trust flow over citation flow ratio, that's improving, like these things are looking good, I think we're going to start getting some traction in terms of organic traffic, and of course the rankings too, in another few months, maybe even less. But in the meantime, just stay patient because things are looking uh, like you know we're heading in the positive direction. Yeah, I mean that that's probably that's probably the other side of the story, right? I mean, I think it really comes down to uh, expectation management in the in the beginning already. And I thankfully we are in a in a situation where when we start working with. Um, new companies, especially, that we 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 do spend quite a bit of time in the in the beginning to manage expectations in terms of timings and when would you see impact and you know what's like, you know what's going to happen in in three months time and why are we doing this after six months and and whatnot. So, um, we 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 oftentimes like do work with like a twelve months somewhat forecast. Um, and the the way to get to the forecast, I think. For us, more than anything, is uh, is, is testing, um, testing on an on an SEO enterprise level, if that um, if that makes sense. Because um, the, my big problem right now with a lot of the discussion and, and 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 things and tweets out there is that people are just kind of they've heard something somewhere or Google said something somewhere, and they just like they, they take it for granted. They're not testing. They're not questioning it. And I think that's highly highly dangerous because. I mean, of course, there's always a PR component to it. Of course, there might be some stuff being kind of lost in translation, right? So there, there's a whole different like level of misinformation that's somewhat in play there as well. So what we ended up doing uh, is one thing, it's called the like the PKS playground, which is just where we're testing and retesting things literally all the time. So is it still true that only the second link kind of passes on link equity and whatnot? Or even on the, on the larger scale for clients, what we end up doing is, we kind of slice the site into different sections and then we start testing. So what if we change the title tags for, you know, those 50 categories, but not for the remaining 50 um, and just try to see um, because no one really knows. I mean, of course, there are best practices. Of course, we have seen and, and uh, you guys as well. We've seen a bunch of things, but that's not necessarily tr true for everyone and everything. Right. Um, so, you know, for one side, what would you do? If you remove all this old crappy SEO text, would it go up? Would it go down? Would it stick? Um, because it's also then a question of like, you know, what's where do we prioritize further investments? This is not so much really part of, of our dashboarding, um, if that makes sense, but rather more from a strategic perspective in the in the very beginning, because it helps us to outline like a, a schedule and a game plan for the next for the next six to twelve months. But I think that's that's fundamentally important. And once you have agreed on that, then of course, um, you, you, well, we would at least set like KPIs, you know, traffic targets or, you know, whatever that is. Um, clearly not rankings, but uh, yeah, I think we agree on that. Yeah, yeah. So, so what you're doing is you're creating a test bed 
and you yeah. have hypotheses and you test those hypotheses. And because we cannot do uh, concurrent testing, like um, multivariate testing and that sort of stuff, AB split tests aren't really applicable to SEO. You have to do tests in serial and say, all right, well, if I make this one change, let's see what the impact is. Let's make this other change to this page after a period of time, see what the impact is. You can't make these multiple changes to the same page and try to tease out which thing moved the needle positively and which thing yeah. moved it negatively. That's just not possible. So the best kind of alternative is to, like, as you said, take half of the category pages and apply one change. Just one thing, one, one variable uh, gets changed and then the other half are the control group that you don't change anything to. And you hope that uh, seasonality and so forth doesn't n affect one group of pages more than another, you know, that, that you've selected a kind of a random uh, half to compare. Yeah, I think you half. need to be relatively smart about selection. That's very true. And timing. But uh, yeah. Um, and then lastly, I mean, the only thing, well, not the only thing, but the other thing that's really important is that just obviously you're not only looking at SEO performance because you can have like a great positive impact in terms of, you know, traffic. Um, testing. I think the, the, the other very important thing about testing is if you would only look at organic traffic, that it can also go wrong, right? Because I mean, you could gain like very nice increases, you know, because of whatever changes you do, but then that traffic is not really qualified, right? You know, it doesn't convert as much as it could be, et cetera, et cetera. So I think like you're, you're completely correct with like selection and then, you know, running one group versus the other group. I think that's, that's the way to do it, but also not only look at you know, kind of SEO success, if that makes sense, but look at like the full funnel in terms of, you know, conversions or signups or whatever you're trying to achieve, because uh, eventually that change, uh, even if it's great for your SEO, goes entirely wrong. Um, so, yeah, I think that's, but that's usually the way that we're trying to do it. Um, so we do have uh, like a bunch of, of course, best practice that we kind of roll out straight away because we very, very, very confident that it works. But then for the, for the, the edge cases or where like it's sensitive to, the client's business or you know very much depending on the industry and the competition then then we would go on with with that approach mm -hmm. now what if you have a prospect that you're speaking with and their seo is a dumpster fire right and if you're not careful you're kind of giving away the goods before you even mm. sign the client so if you tell them like all right you have disallowed uh, like your, I don't know, your most important page other than the home page. I just had this with a, with a client. Uh, I couldn't believe it that, that they have, it's a consumer brand, uh, mm -hmm. one that is somewhat known here in the States and mm -hmm. their recipes page was, uh, it, it was, uh, no indexed and that was awesome. <laughs> I discovered it on <laughs> the first call. So, um, yeah, that stuff happens, and you 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 want to help them out, and yet if you give them all your kind of secret sauce or all the things that you've discovered, then they can just go off and implement it without you. Uh, yeah. So how how do you what like what does this look like for you with a prospect? You've discovered a lot of things in just a few minutes, and are you going to reveal this to them on a call? You're going to reveal it in a proposal. Uh, you're going to take like screenshots of different reporting tools and things and show them just how bad it is without giving them the answer. Like, how does yeah, that I, I, I think it really very much depends on, you know, what type of, uh, um, kind of inquiry that is. I mean, we do live off and that's really, really a good spot to be in a lot of kind of stuff that we get and clients that we wouldn't come through recommendations and we're not in this regular proposal pitch phase where you really need to deliver content first but of course that's 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 the other the other part right and like we we decided at some point that because they will always be looking or talking um to more than one person or agency or you know freelance or whatnot anyways um what we do is we call like we call it a quick check um and what we make very clear is that that is only an excerpt of what we usually find um so it has like Oftentimes it has like top three or top five items that we think they need to tackle. Um, and then, of course, we can be somewhat a bit selective on what we put in or how far we detail it out. 
but I'm I'm honestly oftentimes not really that afraid uh, to to give it away because at the end of the day they still need to understand it they need to implement it they need to execute it and oftentimes this is also where where things go wrong right um, they don't brief the developers properly they they do, they didn't get the full concept of why we were you know outlining this one specific item so we decided we just give like a top three or top five items with and making very very clear that there's probably way more that we need to do. Um, over the course of however we work, kind of come together and then take it from there. But I'm not too shy um, to do that. We oftentimes do include um, uh, screenshots from tools as well, of course, um, for status quo auditing. That certainly helps, um, especially if you have like bigger chunks of things that are wrong to kind of see, uh, you know, um, graphs and things like that. I think that's that's that oftentimes helps. We usually do that in uh, for, so our proposals, our written proposals do not include that, but we just deliver a separate PDF slash presentation, which is oftentimes, I'd say probably around 20 to 25 slides. If it's not like a really large pitch, but if it's like a direct inquiry, then it's something around that, I'd say. Mm -hmm. And uh, how do you set the uh, prospect's expectations around the time it's going to take for the SEO impact to really be felt? Because you maybe ought to do an audit and mm. other kinds of strategic deliverables, which won't get implemented for a period of time after you deliver it. So they're going to start paying, and then months from now, perhaps, they're going to start really implementing in earnest and then months after that they're going to start really seeing the impact how, yeah. how, how do you manage those expectations and what kind of expectations do you set for them yeah i mean um what we what we usually do when we have uh, when we onboard the clients we have like kind of a process where there's a kickoff meeting the project manager is also involved and they are usually in our teams responsible for kind of doing kind of a schedule slash project plan for the next for the following months and that usually has some milestones such as you know we need information until this time then we create an audit that's going to be done until this time um, then this is like an implementation phase um, so we have that all like somewhat on um, on a large uh, paper or spreadsheet or however that that looks like for them um, and then it's it becomes quite clear that well you need four weeks prep you need like an audit you need to implement and then it needs to be tested and roll out so like the first three months well there's nothing even live and then you know we try to model you know what goes live when plus a bit of a buffer and then say well you know six to eight weeks after this goes live then we might start seeing uh, uh traffic increases because we changed the category pages or whatnot so we're trying to model this as good as we can but also what we agree with the clients is that we, so we have like a, like a monthly um, kind of bigger update. Um, and then we also try to see if we need to change uh, timings or, you know, because some, some things didn't play out. They were, you know, as they were supposed to be or something like that. So we try to keep it somewhat as, um, well, yeah, dynamic as it's possible. Um, but I think it's important to do it in the beginning just because otherwise you'd be this, in this discussion saying, well, we put this live, so tomorrow we're going to be seeing something. And as we all know, that's not going to happen in SEO. So I think it's very, very important, like in the, in the kind of a click kickoff phase to be very precise with what is potentially planned, what's going to be on the roadmap when, and when does that somewhat have an impact um, on what I can see. But oftentimes when you do this planning type of situation, we rather try to discuss around or about goals that are like, you know, what's going to happen in the in the period of a year and what where are we stand where are we going to be um KPI slash target wise after twelve months. Yeah. Do you ever whip out that uh estimated four months to a year for SEO to to impact to, to really be felt that from that quote from Miley Oye that gets uh, bandied about a lot from uh, Google yeah. Extra Central video. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. And <laughs> um, let's talk about a particular situation where a prospect or a client has a site migration that they need to do. What are some of the gotchas that uh, will almost certainly be screwed up? Like I'll, I'll give one as an example. Uh, they don't apply. Well, they apply the 301 redirect across the board to everything, and 
they shouldn't because the XML sitemap, the old one, should be kept alive at the old URL with all the old URLs in that sitemap so that Google bot can discover all of the 301 redirects much more quickly. So that Wait, almost yeah. invariably gets screwed up. Everything gets redirected, including the old sitemap. Yeah. There's, I mean, there's so many things that go wrong with migrations, right? I pr could probably spend like another hour just on, on, on migration work, as sad as it is. But yeah, redirects are probably the single biggest thing in, in one way or the other that goes wrong. As you said, could be sitemaps, could be could be everything to homepage, could be that they're forgetting about setting up image redirects, right? One of the classics as well. Like you change all the images and all the image file names and they're on a new CDN or whatnot. And they just don't redirect it. It's going to be all massive amounts of 404s. Fantastic. Well done. Um, robots text deployment from staging to live. Um, you know, pages being way slower because no one did like a stress test on the staging server with the uh, real world traffic. All of a sudden that new site loads like 10 seconds and the other one was just like three seconds or four. Um, you know, people killing, killing or eliminating sections of content decided not to migrate it. And then all of a sudden, well, Big surprise traffic is not there anymore yeah because you deleted a whole bunch of stuff that you thought is not going to be relevant anymore syntax changes and templates you know there's there's so many things that that go wrong and again the the biggest thing that people miss is that they are somewhat that they need log files again because search console is like what three four days delayed analytics doesn't give you crawler behavior you can't really interfere when things go wrong so one of the things that we try to do very early on is try to figure out, you know, who can get us log files? How can we get there? Is it going to be through a SaaS service? It's going to be download, shared through WeTransfer, Dropbox, whatever the solution is, um, something something needs to be there. And what we do like to do, um, especially for larger migrations, is kind of come together when the day of the launch um, and everything is somewhat tested properly and have kind of a war room situation because just communication is way quicker um, once once you're sitting with the relevant people in a, in a big room. Um, we have seen that so many times. It makes a massive difference um, because you do not have to, you know, email, call and whatnot. Yeah, yeah. The devil's in the details in this sort of stuff. Like if, Massively. Uh, uh, for example, you keep the old sitemap alive, but you don't edit it so that you don't touch the file and then it doesn't look like Google should go check it out again and and reprocess it so that's a mistake um, another one is I just had this with a client with a robust.txt file and probably happens more so in migrations than anything but they thought the uh, Googlebot set of directives would get processed in addition to the robot star, like or you know all the robots. Yep. And it's only the Googlebot directives if you have a Googlebot block of of directives. Yep. So that was another one. Yeah, you know, devils in the details. Yeah, I think it's uh, the for migrations. It, you really, no matter how many times you've done it, there's it, it's always good to have like another pair of eyes to just review and cross check because that's like yeah non non migration is the same as another one so it's really important like very thorough testing um automated as well as manually and like a very detailed like we always build those kind of um testing spreadsheets you know who's responsible when is that person testing? Who has like the last say if it can go live and whatnot? Again, it goes also back to managing expectations, right? Because if you know if you agree on an item that the SEO team has the last sign off, then that's very clear from the beginning. However, if you do not define it, then like yeah, yeah, this needs this is oh, this is okay to go live, and all of a sudden people afterwards kind of scream. It's like well, you know, where's the traffic, right? So, I think. Um, planning and execution, a very very thorough execution and documentation is really crucial. Yeah. So I know we're out of time. I have one last question. And that <laughs> is, are you pro AMP or are you thinking, you know, this is just for for Google's own benefit and not really for ours as the SEO community or as the uh, website owners? Like some people are very against AMP and some are very pro AMP, and I'm curious which camp you're in. Um. I think I'm somewhat in the middle. Um, be, I mean, I was I was very vocal two three years ago, and I was like a like a 
session, an interesting session at SMX in Munich, I believe uh, it was, where it kind of got quite a bit of an uproar because I was um, very direct towards uh, a fellow Google panelist um, uh, in the in the same session, and I was I was very much kind of pointing out that I think that you know at the time um, no one really had like an advantage uh, if you were in publishing you did not really have a choice but to do AMP because they would not get you into the carousel. The same is true for like recipes, right? Um, then I was saying that, and I think that's still true, that AMP creates a massive amount of overhead. So you would probably need to adjust your CMS if you want to do publishing of AMP stories or AMP in general really well, then you eventually need other change, uh, other formats, other fields, you know, different length and limitations. Uh, it never works to just con convert existing markup into AMP. Um, CSS, um, you know, HTML needs to be rewritten. So there's a whole bunch of work being involved um, if you if you want to do AMP properly. If you don't want to go full AMP, then that's the same problem again. Um, you basically have the the situation that uh, you have two URLs, so you need both will need to be crawled, um, which is not great. Um, both need to be crawled. And, you know, also from a performance perspective, I think the only reason why Amber is so really insanely fast is because Google actually preloads and prefetches them from the search results. So if you're in the carousel, they know that you're in a carousel. So they basically preload your entire thing, which is this, this perceived speed difference, right? right. Um, which is a bit unfair. I mean, I understand now like web components and bundling is coming eventually. Maybe that's also only because they were told off uh, in terms of regulation that they need to allow others to, but anyways, long discussion. Yeah. I'm somewhat in the middle. I think what the, the most important thing for me really is the fact that I think if you use AMP, um, it should not be an excuse to have a slow loading site in general, because right now, if you use AMP, like only the first click, if you're not going like, uh, full progressive web app in combination with AMP, only the first click from the search result is fast, right? So I think it can't be a way to just say like AMP fixes everything for me because that's wrong. So build a fast site first and foremost. And then of course, if you're in publishing, if you're in recipes and whatnot, there's not much of a choice except to do AMP, right? So I think that's what I'm saying. I'm somewhat in the middle. And of course I cannot sit here and say like, well, for my publishing clients, you don't do AMP. This is not going to happen, right? right. Um, but I think it's a bit of a shame that it's again this political power play in, involved in that as well. However, I do see, of course, that they invest quite a lot of uh, time and dev resources to get this framework. And I think we're now in the third, fourth year um, to something that's actually usable. And I think they made good progress. I have to give it to them. Yeah, yeah, that is for sure true. I'm actually in the process of uh, migrating my stephanspencer.com site uh, into a native AMP, uh, mm -hmm. and yeah, so it's taken longer than I would have liked, but uh, it's hopefully going to make the site screaming fast. Yeah, so, but that's what I'm saying. See, it's not out of the box. You have to do it. Um, it's it's, it's work involved. Work. Yeah. Um, Especially yeah. if you have bloated CSS and you're past the limit, and yep. you have too many plugins, and the speed of the site needs to like, okay, what functionality? What, what functionality am I going to uh, turn off on my site you know, that I really like? Because <laughs> I have these plugins yeah. in place. Yeah, very true. Yeah, it's, it's tough. Anyway, so yeah. if, uh, if folks wanted to reach out to you to Peak Ace to potentially work with you and, and your team, how would they get in touch? And uh, where where should we send them for additional? information and resources um, just to our website i guess so that's dot 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 pa dot ag all right awesome and uh what social platform are you most active on twitter or what yeah mainly mainly on twitter it's uh, at peak ace ag or my personal one is at basgr on twitter awesome well, thank you, Bastian. This was a lot of fun and very informative. Uh, you're very generous with uh, sharing uh, all your cutting edge knowledge and, and wisdom. So thank you for doing that. Stefan, very, very much. Thank you for having me. I do appreciate it. It was good fun. Yeah, yeah. And now, listener, it's time to apply some of this in your business. Take at least three things that you learned from Bastian on this episode and apply them to your business this coming week. This is your host, Stefan Spencer, signing off.